For those that may be a little confused today, I just scared all the youth, which is great. For those that may be a little confused on what's going on, we've had VBS all week, and so our youth are going to lead us in some of the songs. The kids will probably participate that have been here. Matt will get up and give announcements after a while, and then we have a guest speaker today. So that's what's going on. That's the reason it's a little crazy. You're seeing a bunch of kids up here today. So enjoy the service, please. Stand up and sing with them. Stand up and worship with them. Stand up and dance with them. Whatever y'all want to do.
have known the songs for worship today but the uh the worship leaders looked a little cuter than the normal worship leaders amen uh, some of us anyway uh guys i, I just want to tell you uh first off i want to say thank you uh to each and every one of you you made this past week possible um whether you came and you served all the hours in the heat setting up decorations whether you came and you helped teach and helped do songs and helped do food and all the things that make vbs possible uh, maybe you're like i didn't show up not one time last week that's okay too because it's your tithes it's your generosity 
that helps us to put on everything that we get to do. Uh, we had a great week. It was a busy week, a tiring week, um, but it was it was amazing. So thank you to everybody who served. Thank you to all of our teens who every night got up and did the music. Um, and not only that, but what you guys didn't see was the hours that they put in beforehand, the hours that they stayed after. And, you know, most of the time you'll say, oh, they're teenagers. They came up here. They just ran around, played around. Guys, I'm going to tell you, I was here with them. And they were stressing. Like my daughter at home is putting in hours listening to those VBS songs. Um, I'll just level with you. For about two days, he is the light, light, light. It was just in my head, and I'm like, I've never heard this song before in my life, but it's in there now. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I do want to do a couple of announcements before uh, we're releasing kids and, and bringing Reed up. Um, I will say this, in your bulletin, if you picked up one in the back, um, you'll still see that on the 15th and the 22nd of this month, you'll see a cleanup. Uh, that cleanup day is still happening. Uh, I know it's going to be hot, and let me tell you, we're going to be inside of a uh, barn, so it's going to be super hot. Uh, if you have heat sensitivity, uh, there are some little odd jobs inside of the house that she needs done, so if you want to serve but you're like, hey, I just can't be in the heat, uh, we can get you some jobs done. Um, but this is going to be a huge, huge, huge blessing for her. Um, as she's not able to do it herself. Uh, you'll also see in there that all month, I told our Sunday school class, I actually went over as we were doing Sunday school, all month this month we are doing ministry team signups. What that is is this. If you are uh, a member here, if even some of these teams, if you are just a visitor here, um, depending on the team, uh, I'll let you know for our teams uh, if you're going to be a teacher, if you're going to be uh, helping to lead worship, any of those things, we do ask uh, that you are a member. Uh, but there's a whole lot of things. If you're just a visitor that you're like, hey, we're not sure about being members yet, you know what, audiovisual, uh, not to be mean, a visitor can push a button the same way a member can. So uh, we'd love for you, if you have an interest, a passion, if God has laid something on your heart, to sign up. And, uh, and I'll get with you, you know, if we need to talk about something, I'll get with you. But this is your opportunity, uh, like I told them in Sunday school. There's about 15 different ministries here that are listed out. This is an opportunity for us to kind of gauge what direction we're going to go as a church over the next 365 days. Uh, it's an opportunity to let go of some ministries that may not be necessary at Anthony Drive anymore. Um, and as hard as that is to say, if nobody here is willing to do those ministries, it's time to cut them loose. And so it's your opportunity to, to just really pray about it. And I would ask you to do that. Over the next two weeks, I'm going to lay these sheets out across this front pew. Um, they're all going to be here. I would ask that you just cruise by, take a look, pray about where God would have you to serve. Don't sign up today. Uh, don't sign up next Sunday. Just be in prayer and just say, okay, God, where can I be useful? Where am I needed? Um, and pray about it. If you have a ministry that God has placed on your heart that is not on these sheets, talk to me. And we need to strike while the iron is hot on that. If God is, is, if God is calling you into something, we want to come alongside you as a church and help you with that and, uh, and bless you in that ministry as much as we can. And so that's my big push for ministry teams this, this month is please, please, please pray about what God can do with you over the next 365 days. Um, I will say I'm super excited about today. Uh, I had a lunch meeting with uh, Mr. Bob White, and uh, if you know the White family, amazing family. Uh, I, I think the world of them, respect them a ton. And so... Um, when he asked me, he said, you know, Reed has, has been on this has been on this missionary journey, really, and I'm not going to steal his thunder. I'll let him talk about it. But he said he would love the opportunity to come and speak and, and, and just present to the church. And I was like, man, this sounds great. So, uh, so Reed White is going to come today. He's going to share with us what he's been doing over the past 
year, basically, uh, what God's been doing in his life. And I'm just going to let you know, I'm excited. I've made this joke three times today, but a fourth one won't hurt. Um, you know, back in the day, in Baptist churches, we used to had we used to have youth-led Sundays where the kids got up and did everything. Uh, this kind of inadvertently turned into that. And so I'm super excited to watch as the next generation of Christians kind of starts to take the helm and I get to turn into the old man that now gets to yell at them about being too loud in church, right? Um, I'm excited for my time as the old cogity man. So some of y'all need to move over. It's, it's Matt Walker's turn. Um, let's pray for Reed as he comes forward and uh, we'll dismiss our kids. For our kiddos, if you are age three, up through grade three in school, right after our prayer, you guys can head down that hallway for Children's Church. There is a nursery down that same hallway. Miss Alice is down there for those under age three. Uh, Reed, let me pray for you, and uh, we'll get started. Father God, we just love you. Lord, I come to you, God, asking for a blessing over this young man today. God, I pray that as he stands up to, uh, to just share his experiences and to share your word. Father, I pray that you would just help him to recall everything that has happened in his life. I pray, God, that you would just allow us to just share in the blessings that he has encountered. And Father, I pray, God, that through his message, that through his words, God, that you would use him as a vessel. And I pray, God, that if there is a soul here, if there is someone here who doesn't know you, Father, that through this young man that they might come to know you before it's too late. Father, we love you. Lord, I thank you. I'm excited for what is happening today. I'm excited for the energy that these kids are bringing. I'm excited for what you're doing in this young man's life, and I thank you for it. God, we just praise you. It's in Jesus' mighty name we ask. Amen. 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 Kids, if y'all want to come on, y'all can come on. Thank you. Good morning. Um, so, I'm going to start us off with prayer. Lord, thank you for allowing us to be together here this morning. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to worship with kids' worship. And um, I just thank you for allowing me to speak here. I pray that you speak through me, Lord, and pray that you give me the words to say. And any words that are not from you, may they fall on deaf ears. Lord, I just pray that, that, you, can, that you can work today, Lord. I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. So, I've never been to Anthony Drive before. Um, I have always heard great things, though. I will, I will say I know some people that go here. I have... I have friends that have been a part of the youth group, and um, I've always heard really good things, so it is a pleasure to be here, although I will admit I did have to put Anthony Drive in my maps this morning, and I was a little bit surprised. I didn't realize that it was right here. I had always heard my friends talk about it. I was like, huh, I wonder where Anthony Drive is, but hey, here we are. It's, this is a nice church, so thank you for having me this morning. Um, as he briefly mentioned, I went on a mission trip. I went on a mission trip this past year. It was a uh, gap year, gap year mission trip for nine months. I pretty much went around the world. I started in a town called Gainesville, Georgia, Georgia and America. And um, then I, I trained there. I went from there to Cambodia, from there to South Africa, from South Africa to a small country inside of South Africa called Lesotho. I don't know if anybody here has ever heard of Lesotho, but it is basically a mountain range inside of South Africa that has kept its statehood and is its own nation. Because South Africa, if you don't know, is a bunch of different nations, and then it was colonized and is now one big country, but Lesotho kept theirs. And um, that's very interesting. It's a, it's a very cool culture. It still where we were at least was still subsistence farming, so you know there's corn everywhere. 
Um, just, it's a cool place. Beautiful, beautiful country. Um, and then from there, I went to Guatemala. Uh, most time I spent was in Cambodia. Cambodia was there for about three months, and then about a month in South Africa, a month in Lesotho, and about two months in Guatemala. At the beginning of the end, there was some training and then debriefing. Um, that's kind of a, a gist of, of what happened, of what I did. And in these countries, we did ministry, we did evangelism, we did kids' ministry, we did manual labor, we did lots of different ministries working with, working with long-term missionaries there. So we would go, and I had a big group. I had a group of about 45 people, and we were called a squad. We were six teams. So my team was smaller. It was a team of just guys. Um, that guy right there, can you raise your hand, Nate? He was on my team. He's from Maryland. Um, but we went around the world together, and now I'm back here, and I hope to be able to share, share some good things. Um, I'm going to start off with a couple testimonies to hopefully share the goodness and the power of God. Um, I'm going to start with a testimony from South Africa. So one day, me and my friends, Nate was there, um, we went and did some evangelism in South Africa, some street evangelism. And we're walking around, and we met this man on the side of the road. He was sitting down, and he had herbs and different medicinal type things in front of him. He was selling them. He was trying to sell us some, and, and we were just trying to tell him about Jesus. So we're standing there in front of him. I believe it was six of us. And we were sharing the gospel. And at the time, while we were sharing the gospel, I was unsure if he was really even hearing the words that we were saying because he was very lifeless. He, his eyes were dead. He just kind of sat there and looked at us. Wasn't really responding in any way. Um, so I just wasn't, wasn't sure how things were going. And then we found out he was a Rastafarian. And so, if you don't know, the Rastafarian religion is basically a religion that follows and worships a, a king in Africa. So there, there's, there was a king in Africa. People, once he died, people were like, wait, this guy was the second coming of Jesus. And they said, oh, look, there's some prophecies here that he fulfilled. We should worship him. He's the, I guess, true Jesus in a way, almost like Jesus was the half Jesus. It, it's not good, right? But lots of people in Africa follow that. And this man was one of them. Luckily, we had a man with us that we worked with that used to be a Rastafarian, so he understood what he, was, what he followed. And he was able to share. He was able to go, this is false. This is a false religion. This is a corrupted gospel. Jesus is the one true king, the one true Messiah. And we shared these things with him. And he's not really responding much. He, he shared he was a Rastafarian. He shared a couple of things. But once we were pretty much done talking, we're kind of just standing there waiting for his response. You know, Most of the time we go and we share the gospel with people, and they go, okay, cool, I'll think about it, or... Maybe they don't like it, whatever it is, and we walk away. But um, after we were done, he goes, just a couple days ago, I was praying, and I realized I didn't have peace about this God that I follow, this man that I worship. And so what he did was he asked God for truth. He sat there and he said, with a sincere heart, I just wanted to know truth. And I asked God, I said, please reveal yourself to me. And what happened was, right after that, he received a vision. Now, this vision didn't make any sense to him. Because all that, all that happened was there was an image of six guys standing in front of him. He was just sitting there. And six guys were just standing in front of him as he was sitting on the ground, 
And he had no idea what that meant. And then he said, what I'm seeing right now with y'all standing in front of me was the vision I received. I saw y'all coming before you even came. What happened was he had a heart, a sincere heart that wanted to know God. And even though he was blinded by a different religion, by a different faith, by a false God, by a corrupted gospel, he said, God, I want to know truth. Please reveal it to me. And God did. Being on the mission field, I was with a lot of other missionaries, and I realized that this is very much within God's character. When people seek God and they seek truth, God will reveal himself. It's clear. Paul says you have no excuse. If nobody says it, nature will reveal it. Nature will, re nature will reveal God's glory. This just showed God answers those who want him. And it was an incredible testimony of God's power and God's love for those who seek him. Um, I'm going to share another testimony. This testimony was from Cambodia. So, give a little backstory of what I was doing. This, there was a month in Cambodia where me and my team, we weren't with our squad anymore. We got dropped off at a high school. And there was, we were with a ministry. This ministry was trying to plant people in different places so hopefully people can go back. So this was actually the one time where me and my team kind of started something in a way or we weren't with people that had been there for a long time. So this was a ministry that tried to have people in different places, tried to help in different tangible ways as well as bringing Jesus. And um, one day, about halfway through Cambodia, a van picks us up, drive us about two hours out of the city of Siem Reap, which is where we stayed the first month we were in Cambodia, and they dropped us off at a high school in the countryside, the middle of nowhere. And we got out, and they had a big sign that said, Welcome Team Epimone, which was my team's name. Um, it's Greek, right? It means long-suffering. No, endurance and long-suffering. Um, but it was funny to us because our, we kind of thought of our name as pretty silly, and then there was this big official sign, and they were super excited for us to be there. We were like, wow, what is even happening here? I guess this is a, a serious operation going on. And then they take us into one of the buildings there, and they take us to a classroom, and they said, okay, you can stay here, and um, later you can meet the English teacher, and he'll tell you what to do. So now we're like, all right, well, we've got a classroom. That's good. The classroom actually had air conditioning, which is one of the only times we had air conditioning for the entire trip, which was super nice. Um, and we did have our sleeping pads. So we didn't have beds, but our sleeping pads was, were awesome um, and nice and comfortable. And then we met the English teacher, and we find out that there's, this is not actually an organized thing at all. They just kind of dropped us off at a high school. And so then... We're just there to share the gospel, plant seeds for future ministry, and teach English. So then we start teaching English. And every day we would, we would go, and we'd teach English. We only had like a couple classes a day. We didn't do that much, so we, we were sitting there, and we were like, all right, what do we do, guys? Because um, I don't want to just sit around for a month. And so then we found a Korean, there was a Korean church nearby that, the primary job was they would take in kids and they would let them stay there and then they would tutor them and stuff. But we went there and we helped out some there. And then that kind of fell off and we ended up just teaching. And we were kind of at a spot where we were like, all right, what do we do? We're teaching for two, three hours a day. We've got a lot of time on our hands. And then we met these two kids. They were 15 years old. And it was pretty clear to me that it was a divine appointment pretty quickly because um, one, of our, one of our team members had left the field and gone to a wedding, and he, he had gotten back one day, and him and the long-term missionaries that we were with in the, in the city had taken, taken him out there. And they had met these two kids, 
and they come and they have lunch with us and they're like, hey, we met these two kids. They speak pretty, they speak English pretty well and they want to be tutored. They want you to help them with English. They want to go to school in, in America and everything. I was like, wow, that's cool. Let's do that. And then another guy on the team, he says, oh, I met these two kids that are pretty good at English and they, they want to learn more. It's like, all right, wow, we're getting, we're getting this going. We're going to be able to you know, spend some time with kids, share the gospel, help them with their English. And then I met these two kids later that day, and they're, I'm talking to them, and then they give me their phone. It's on Facebook with the, on the search bar, so okay, I'll give, them, give you my Facebook. If you're friends with me on Facebook, you might have had some Cambodian people try to friend you, because they will just friend anybody that comes across their suggested list. But... The, they give me their phone, and I go to look up my name, and there are already like three of my team members' names on there that they had already looked up previously that day. I'm like, oh, you're these kids. They're like, yeah. I'm like, okay, can you, can you teach, teach us English? I'm like, yeah, sure. Let's do it tomorrow. So the next day I meet with them, and uh, it, was a, it was a boy and a girl. They were 15 years old, and the boy draws me some art. I thought that was really cool. That's just a random side note. It was just some anime art. It was pretty cool, but then we end up meeting every day. We meet a couple days for an hour, hour a day, and then we're like, hey, I only have like two weeks left here. Let's just meet two hours a day. So we start meeting two hours a day, and usually spilling over into my next class this time. Sorry, Nate. Nate would usually have to fill in for me, um, but it, it ended up being like two and a half, three hours a day that I would spend with them, and this whole time I'm teaching them English, they're asking me all these questions about grammar, like how do I use this in a sentence? And half the time I don't know because <laughs> English is very complicated and I've kind of just learned it by speaking as many of you have. And they're just asking all these questions. I'm like, man, I'm sorry, dude. I don't, I don't know what that is, but, but Nate's pretty smart so he was able to help a lot of the times. Um, but they're asking all these questions, they're asking about American culture, and so I teach them about American food. I'm pretty good at that. And I was telling them, you know, where all this food comes from? Oh, pizza, you know, came here and then it spread through the U.S. and this and that. Somehow I just knew all about that. And, and then we talked to them about universities and, you know, what universities they want to go to. For the longest time, I thought the guy was telling me he wanted to go to Howard University. And I was looking it up. I was like, okay, seems pretty reasonable, reasonable but it's really random to want to go to Howard University. And then he finally shows it to me on his phone one day. He's like looking up something about Howard. And he's like, oh, it's Harvard. This whole time, I'm like, it was actually Harvard. And I'm like, dude, I'm, I'm sorry, but I don't think you're going to get into Harvard. And I don't think I was ever able to get that fully into his head. But now he's looking at some other school, which is cool. But um, hey, a lot of people there, they don't understand how difficult things are, which is you know, understandable. But um, we went forward, and we spent all this time together. And I try to slip in Jesus, and it was starting to get pretty difficult. Um, I think there were three or four days left, and one morning I was a little discouraged because every time I would talk about the gospel or anything related to Jesus, the Bible, they seemed to be losing interest. Because, you know, at first, like, these people never have heard about Jesus before. And so at first, like, wow, that's super cool, and you're encouraged. And then it kind of wanes most of the time. And so I'm getting to this point where I'm like, man, I feel like we're regressing here. So one morning, I spend a couple hours writing a newsletter to send to the people following my trip. I say, hey, I've got these two kids, and they really are interested in, in America, English, all this, so I've been able to spend time with them. I've been spending a lot of time with them recently. and. I really need prayer. I need prayer that the Lord will soften their hearts to the gospel, that they will be able to see it, because right now they just can't see it. They understand that it's a good thing, but they can't see that it's truth. They can't see that they need it. So people pray. I think I had upwards of 100 people pray for these kids on the other side of the world. And that afternoon, I went to go spend time with them. And it was crazy because the whole time, 
It was questions about English, culture, everything like that beforehand. I get there, all of a sudden, hey, Reed, how do I pray? Can you teach me how to pray? I don't understand what this is. So luckily, a couple days prior to that, I had spent some time, we had some free time, so I had spent some time writing up a presentation on how to pray, just in case anybody ever asked me that. So then I was able to share that with them. And I spent about half an hour doing that. I'm like, wow, I got half an hour in today. That, those prayers were answered. And then after that, I ask another question about the gospel. And then another, and then another. And all of a sudden, I look at my watch, and I've been preaching the gospel for two hours. And these kids are just soaking it all in. And then I say, I need you all to think about this. Because I know this is a lot. Obviously, if I'm talking about it for two hours, it was just a lot. And I said, okay. And we were celebrating... We were celebrating the girl's birthday that evening, and we were going to go hike up a mountain. And so then we did that. We hiked up a mountain, saw a beautiful sunset. And then after that, they said, we want to accept Jesus. We want to do it. We want to follow him. And I was able to see in that moment, in this testimony, just how much, how powerful prayer is. I was also able to see it as we were able to see in the last testimony God's heart for those who want him. And he, he answered those prayers. We had, I, had, I texted my grandma. My grandma's texting her prayer group of like 50 people. They're all praying, and it spread to others. And those that read my blog, and I texted specific people directly. And all these people were praying. They were, just, they were interceding for their souls they said, Lord, please reach out to them. Please touch these kids because they need to understand the truth of the gospel. And the Lord blessed that. We got to see him move. And they're still seeking after him today. After this, some of it we saw while we were still there in Cambodia because after we left that high school, we were there for a little bit longer. And we were able to go back to the school, get people together, and share the gospel, give a gospel presentation. And we got quite a few people from the high school together and we were able to do that. And we saw a girl later from that come to Christ. These kids, these two kids, and the other girl that came to Christ came and visited us in the city. And there we were able to get connected to one of their friends that lived in the city. He now comes to church. He now is spreading the gospel in his school. He's in high school. They see new people come to church regularly because he is now an evangelist. Because of the connections that we got from reaching these people, it's spreading. It's spreading in the youth in Cambodia, which is huge. Cambodia is so hungry for the gospel, and it is so starved. It is a dark place spiritually, very dark, And we are seeing light come to Cambodia through the spread of the gospel. These testimonies are testimonies that show God's answer to prayer. We see the story with the man that was Rastafarian. We pray before we evangelize. We say, God, go before us. Sometimes I don't realize just how how powerful of a prayer that can be. We pray, God, go before us. Before VBS, we pray, God, please go before us. Reach these kids. Soften these kids' hearts. When you go share the gospel, you would would pray beforehand, God, please touch them now. Work in them now. And then we'll go, we share with them, their hearts already softened. Here we pray that prayer. And we got to see that God actually went before us days before. So when we prayed that prayer, he had already done it. But he answered that prayer. See, with these kids, God answered that prayer, those many prayers. What was especially beautiful here was people across the world got to see that their prayers are powerful on the other side of the world. I have lots of people. I went and visited my grandma, my grandparents, a couple weeks ago, and they're just talking about how excited their prayer group was, their Bible study was, because they got to be a part of that. 
they got to see my blog post. They got to hear that they, they need to pray because these kids are close. These kids, they want to know Jesus, but they're, they're falling back. They, they can't understand it. And they prayed, and they were a part of that. They get to hear the testimony. Your prayers are powerful. You can pray for missionaries, and that will have impact. You can pray for Ennis. Intercede for those you know that don't know Jesus. They can't see the truth of the gospel. Those that are blinded, pray for them. Pray that God will remove that blindfold. Because prayer works. That sounds kind of silly to say, but prayer works. God blesses those that pray with a sincere heart. And I'm going to shift a little bit here because as I was gone, I, there was a lot of talk about and a lot of eyes being opened to how some of the things are here in America. So I'm going to talk about America now because as many of you know, we're not in the best spot. But I hope to share possibly some encouragement. Um, because if you're not aware, right now we are seeing revival in my generation. I love, Matt, Pastor Matt, that you introduced us and said, you know, this is, a, this is kind of a young people sort of youth service. Um, and... And I think that's big. And you talked about us kind of taking, taking the reins a little bit in the future. And, and that, is, that is some of what I want to talk about today because of the attitude towards my generation right now as well as the state of it. Because as many of you know, you can see things on social media, on the media, whatever. And you can see that in a lot of ways, my generation's not in a very good spot. My generation has lots of sin. Many people have their hearts turned towards sin and they're chasing after it. And they don't see anything wrong with it. But there are good things happening. There are good things happening in America right now. If you're not aware, there has been revival breaking out among the college college age students across America. Asbury, if you're not aware, had weeks of revival and many people coming to Christ, many people being revived in their faith. And one of the things I realized, there was actually one, one of the ministries that I did with my squad was we went to Kentucky before, before we left for Cambodia, right after training. And we were there, and we were working hard. We had just gone through this intense training camp, and we were on fire for Jesus. We were ready to go out into the field. We wanted to worship all day long, and we were serving, and we were tearing out homes. And it was, it was, in a, it was disaster relief for, in Kentucky for a flooded area. And we were working hard, and we were worshiping, and we were praying. And... Many of the people there, they were, they were older, and they, were, they all said that they had been so discouraged by what they see in our generation across the U.S. Because they see, oh, our generation is just so against God, which in some ways is true. In many ways, our generation is falling away. However... We are seeing people come to Christ with a sincere faith. We are seeing people come and encounter God and have their lives transformed everywhere. Because the difference now in our generation as opposed to the older generations is we are no longer a Christian culture, which is sad. However, one of the things that's good about it is we have to draw the line in the sand. And I, I have a friend. I didn't have this plan. I'm going to go ahead and share this. But I have a friend that goes to the University of Texas in Austin. 
And there it is a very worldly place, extremely worldly. It is hard to find a, another Christian there if you just walk around and ask people. And many of them do not like Christians. He has introduced himself as a Christian to many people and received uh, negative, very negative responses. And I've talked to him about that. I'm like, man, that must be really hard. You know, coming from a town that is more Christian, it's more of a Christian culture. A lot of people here go to church, and you go to Austin, and it's, it's quite the opposite. And one thing he says, I was very surprised by, is he says, it's actually kind of nice for him. Because what he sees is that instead of everybody just being this cultural Christian and going along with things, they have to make the decision whether to stand firm in Christ or fall away. Because if you just say you're a Christian, you say you follow Jesus, you're going to get ridiculed. It's not a, oh, I have to say I'm Christian or else people are going to think I'm a bad person. No, in fact, it's quite the opposite. And he appreciates it. Because when he stands and he goes to his church and he worships, when he goes to student ministry and he worships and he prays with people, he said, people here know Jesus and they are making a sacrifice to follow him. And that's valuable. It's valuable to have that. Instead of just being there, everybody being there because they think they're supposed to. Instead, he's going and these people are fighting the fight. They have to choose Jesus every day despite what's coming against them. And we're seeing this happen more and more. Despite what you might see the world say, or even many Christians, they're very down on things. They're very negative and bitter towards this generation, towards the younger generation. I would like to say that that is not the whole story. There's, there is change happening, and there is more coming. There are leaders being raised up in my generation that are making a change. One thing I want to share here is a verse, Matthew, or two verses, Matthew 9, 37 and 38. Now, this first verse is one that is shared very often, and many of you are probably very familiar with. It says, Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Now, this is an amazing verse. I love this. You have to go out and be a laborer. Be a laborer for the Lord. Share the love of Jesus. Do good to others. Love others. All of these good things. But Jesus is point here, the one that he says, isn't telling everybody to be laborers. Instead, he's talking, he's talking to the church here. He's not saying you just have to do a lot more necessarily. He's saying, right after that, he says, therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So here, I want to ask you to pray for laborers, to pray for change, to pray for people that will go out and they will reach our generation because our generation wants the gospel. Many do not know it yet, but they do. I want to look at some of these things that our generation, and really everybody ever wants because this is what God has for us, and everybody desires what God has for us, even if they don't know it. I'm going to look through just four, four aspects of Christ and of the church that you can see clearly everybody is looking for in this generation that they just don't know is found in Christ or found in the church. Number one is peace. So many people right now are grasping for peace. They're grasping for so many things of the world that they think will bring them peace. 
They chase so many worldly things. And they don't understand that it's found in Christ. Almost our entire generation is anxious about the future. They are all unsettled. They don't know where to go. They don't know what their purpose is. They don't know what their identity is. And that's the next one, is identity. People don't have an identity without Christ. They try to find it, and they can kind of make up their own. They can make it out of these worldly, these worldly things, right? They can identify with um, different communities and different, different worldly, worldly things, right? And they, they make up their own. They say, this is who I am, and because I do this. Well, this is one of the things that I recognize coming back to America was you go to other countries and you evangelize and you kind of start off with some small talk and you ask them about their lives and you might have three options that you're going to get that you know are coming. In America, you ask people and they're going, there are 100,000 different options. People are going to have this or that, oh, I do this and this is who I am. I am, I don't know, random, I'm a mountain biker. This is what I do, this is who I am, this is me. Right? They have different hobbies. They have different um, political affiliations that they make their identity. And so all of these people are seeking identity. And to go back to the first one, they don't have peace. They make up their own identity, and they don't have peace about their identity. Next one that they're grasping for is community. So many people are just seeking community. That's another reason why you see so many people join all these various groups. Oh, well, this group has a good community. I like how mountain bikers act to, towards each other. They're really kind. Right? They join these communities that there are people in so that they can feel like they belong somewhere. And again, we see across the board they're still unsatisfied. They're still grasping for more. Because peace and identity in good community is found in Christ and found in the church. And the last one I have here is purpose. You see, everyone is searching for purpose. Everyone. You see people chase it through social justice. You see people chase it through different career paths and all this, right? This is, I think, more in our generation than ever before because you see so many people, they don't even want to join the workforce anymore. Now, yes, a lot of that is being lazy, but also a lot of it is people going, I don't want to just work and serve a company or whatever. You see lots of people will say that. And they want to instead chase something that has purpose, and so they'll chase something else, and they'll do all these, all these random things, random activities, and they're chasing to have they're seeking to have a purpose in this world, in our society. They're seeking to make a difference. And we know that your true purpose is through Christ. If you're not serving Christ, there's not real purpose there. Because it's not everlasting. Right? We see throughout Scripture, throughout the New Testament, that we have to stop chasing these worldly things because they're unfulfilling. They all rot, they collect dust, and they'll get stolen. Everything. Instead, store up treasures in heaven. Instead, set your eyes on things above. And that's not just something that Jesus and Paul say for fun. When we do that, we have a true sense of purpose. We do have an actual purpose because it's lasting. These people are all grasping for Christ, yet they're blindfolded. Satan has blindfolded them. They can't see what they want. We can see, oh, hey, you want all of these things? Yeah, this is found in Christ. They can't see it. They're blinded. They're in chains. And instead of 
being bitter towards them, we need to be in prayer for them. Because that's one of the things, again, that I saw. Being with people in America, lots of Christians in America, in Kentucky, in different places in the church, there was lots of bitterness. They said, wow, y'all are actually good people. Y'all actually follow Jesus. All of the rest, they're awful. Yes, they're living in sin. Their sin is evil. But instead of being hateful towards them and bitter towards them, we need to be in prayer towards them. I want to read 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. It says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. I want us to remember this and remember this in our prayer, remember this in how we walk and how we view these people. Because we're not fighting against them. It can seem like we're fighting against them because they're against God. However, we have to remember that they are blinded. Right now, they are grasping for Christ. They are grasping for what we have in the church and for what is found in Christ. They want purpose. They want peace. They want identity. They want community. We have that. Christ has that. So I want to challenge you that instead of looking at this and going, man, they are awful, horrible people, and I wish they weren't here. I wish they would just leave America if they don't like it. I wish they would just leave, be gone. I don't want them anymore. I don't want them in the church. I don't want people like that here. I don't want to be involved with them. Instead, reach them. Pray for them. Because we're trying to reach them. My generation of Christians is. We are trying. We are fighting for it. And whether you get involved or not, directly, please be in prayer. Because you're not fighting against them. And that's the first thing that I had to learn when trying to reach those that are non-believers and those that believe all the world's lies in my generation. Is It seems like we're fighting against them. It seems like they're our enemy. Oh, they're taking away the Christian values of America. Oh, they're taking all of these things away from us. And they're evil. Instead, please recognize that this is the doing of Satan, and he has blinded them. And we have to seek to reach them in prayer and in action. I would even go as far as to say to... Stop worrying about the culture war. Because I can say, as being a part of my generation, that us trying to fight for our culture back is not going gonna, not gonna to work. Nobody cares about the old culture, wanting to preserve that, keep that. Nobody cares. Instead, we have to pray that the Holy Spirit will transform lives, that God will come and move in these people, and we'll reach them. That we, we need to pray that there are laborers that go out and preach the gospel and share with these people and show the love of Jesus with these people so that their lives may be transformed and they may come to Christ. They may join the church instead of just fighting that things were the old way. So we need to fight for their souls. We need to have a heart for them. We need to recognize that they're not evil. They are blinded. Please, please recognize their need for Jesus and intercede for them, for their souls, because they need it. And we can see movement here from prayer. Because many of us are fighting for there to be more revival, for there to be more movement, for more people in our generation to come and see the goodness of God, to recognize his power, his glory, 
and his goodness. And we need help from prayer. We need intercession for those that are wanting God, yet they don't know it. Another thing, when we think about this, this kind of culture war, we think about how America's drifted away from Christ, and my generation's drifting away from Christ. We can stand in confidence of Jesus. We can stand in the confidence of God because we don't have to be worried that we're going to lose some war because Jesus has already won. We can stand here in victory knowing that Christ has won. And we're just trying to show more people the love of Jesus. We're just trying to show more people how good God is. And they need him. We've already won. You don't need to sit here in fear. You don't need to sit here being bitter towards people or, or worried that we're going to lose. Because we can't lose. We've already won. Jesus defeated death. Jesus defeated sin. And it has no power anymore. None. And so we get to sit here today and every day in victory. We have to remember that. We need to pray that others will see the truth so that the truth can set them free as well, so that the truth can give them victory in Christ as well. And let us remember when we, if you're here and you don't, know what it even means to have a heart for those that are lost in this generation. You struggle. You say, ah, it's just so hard for me to see that because, because I just, it's evil. Yes, sin, sin is evil. It, it's hard. You see the sin and your reaction is to be angry at it. And that's okay. Be angry at sin. But don't be better towards these people. If you're struggling with that, Pray that God will help you and pray that God will soften these people's hearts. And remember what the gospel is because we had all fallen short. We, had all, we have all once been in a place where we were lost, where we didn't know Christ, and where we didn't, we weren't able to see the truth of the gospel, see the goodness of God. We are all fallen. And we need to pray that more people can recognize the sin that they live in and recognize that Jesus has already saved them from it. Because they want it. They do. It might not seem like they want Jesus, but they do. Pray that God will soften their hearts to the truth of the gospel. Because it is truth. If Jesus calls you to be an evangelist, if the Lord says, hey, I need you to share the gospel more, we're all called to share the love of Jesus. Remember what you have in Christ and remember the truth of the gospel. Remember that when you speak to somebody and you say, and you're thinking, man, this person is a worldly person. This person hates God. This person is believing all the lies. Remember that we hold truth, and everybody needs to and wants to hear it. Again, even if they don't know it. So again, let's remember, let's remember the gospel. What happened? Jesus died. He took our sin. He took our sin and he died. And he rose again, atoning for that sin, and it no longer has a hold anymore. So we are free. We are able to recognize that, and we live in freedom through Christ now. Let us bring that to America. Please, let's bring it back. Let us have a heart for those who don't know him, and let us... Spend time with him so that we can see how good he, he, how good he is even more so that we can share that love with others. Lord, thank you for this time today. 
Thank you for allowing us to gather here. I just pray that as we go forward this week and as we go on in our lives, that we can remember how good you are, that we can remember what we have in you, Lord. We have everlasting life, and now we don't have to focus on the things of this world. We don't have to fight against the things of this world. Instead, we can live with you and be free in you, Lord. Let us recognize the need of those without you, Lord, and let us take action. Let us be in prayer. Let us continue that going forward, Lord. Pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you. All right, we've got uh, we got another hour left, so I'm going to go. No. Uh, you know something that Reed said it, it struck a chord with me, and, and I'm going to I'm going to be honest with you. Um, you know the one time that the word generation is used in the New Testament that really popped into my mind. It may be used more times, but it's when Jesus calls out the Pharisees. And he says, you wicked and evil generation. Who told you to flee from the wrath of God? What do you come to see? But you're seeking a sign. And so I thought about that where here are the Pharisees who think that they are doing God's plan, right? They think, and in their mind, they're doing it. And yet Jesus comes along and says, this generation is evil and wicked because you're not actually seeking after God. You're just seeking after God tradition you're just seeking after what you've always known and so it's really difficult for us you know I I thought about this as we talk about generations Um, you know my my grandfather was a military guy uh, was in the air force and so my dad in order to rebel against him grew his hair long and you know listened to Pink Floyd and you know Led Zeppelin and stuff and you know my, my granddad probably told him get a haircut and then you know, my dad growing up, the hippie that he was, you know, for me to rebel against my dad, I can remember being a teenager and my dad going, you know, if you want to grow your hair long, you can grow your hair long. I won't be mad at you. And I was like, no, you know, because that was dad's thing. And I'm like, no, I'm going to cut it short. Well, joke was on me. I cut it way too short. Um, But, you know, I listened to music that my dad was like, no, you know, I hate this music. And you know, my kids listen to stuff now that I'm like, they're not even speaking English. Like, they're not even saying words, you know. When I get back from vacation, we're going to talk about speaking in tongues. And I'm pretty sure that's what Cardi B and some of these rap artists do. Like, I'm just like, I don't even understand this. And my daughter's like, this slaps. And I'm like, I have no idea what you're even saying. Like, it's like this Martian language, right? Huh? You listen to them speak. It just sounds like gibberish. You're like, what are you even saying to each other? But they all start laughing. And I'm like, I guess you're talking about me. My kids are going to grow up, and they're going to have children, and their children are going to do everything they can to dig at them, right? And I'm going to look at them as a grandfather and go, it's okay, they're just weird. Like, generations do that to one another. And I think Reed hit the nail on the head, though, is when you say every generation looks at the generation that follows and goes, well, it wasn't this bad in my day, right? Right? I mean... You older folks, you look at us and you go, well, it wasn't as bad as, you know, we we didn't have it this bad. I look at what my kids grow up in and go, man, it wasn't this bad. My kids are going to grow up and look at their kids and go, it wasn't this bad. Let me tell you the beautiful thing, though. And what it reminded me of was as I watched all these kids jump around on stage. Are these kids perfect? No. Right? Are they fully sanctified? No. As much as my daughter likes to think that she is, she's not. Are they all going to grow up to be pastors and worship leaders? Sadly not. Okay? But here's the thing. You are seeing in the middle of what everybody else will say is the worst generation to ever come about. You are seeing children. You are seeing teenagers. You are seeing young adults stand up and say, I'm not ashamed of my faith. I'm not ashamed to worship. I'm not ashamed to proclaim Jesus Christ. And guys, I'm going to tell you what, I'm super thankful for guys like Reed 
who didn't give in to the world standard of what 20 should look like. Right? How old are you? 19. Okay, I was close. Man, super close. You look mature. At 19, what does the world say you should be doing at 19 years old? Right? Not to get super personal, what were some of you doing at 19 years old? Keep it to yourself. This ain't testimony day. But for Reed to stand up and say, at 19, I'm going to buck what everything says I'm supposed to be doing. And I'm going to go over here and I'm going to serve Jesus Christ. Guys, listen, if nothing else, be encouraged that there are young people in this generation who are still being moved and used by God Almighty. Amen? Amen. And it continues. Guys, I'm going to be honest with you. All of you here in blue shirts, I'm going to be 100% with you. We don't talk about this often. But I'll tell you that through our association and other associations, they will give you grants and send you on mission trips. So if you are a teenager and you are coming out of high school and you think, you know what, I feel like God is wanting to use me somewhere else. I've got connections, guys. I can get you to Africa. Guys, we can get you to Honduras. We can get you places. If God is saying, Go be useful in another country. Go be useful in another country. Here's the other challenge. If God is telling you to go be useful next door, then go be useful next door. What Reed did is phenomenal, and not a lot of people get that chance. You know what we all have the chance to do is leave this place today and go to our neighbor and say, Do you know the gospel? Have you heard it? You can be missionaries in your own backyard, guys. Today's the day to do that. If you need a relationship with Jesus, maybe you're here and you're like, I'm so far from being a missionary, I don't even know if I'm saved, right? Maybe you're one of those people that Reed talked about where you are violently against the gospel. I would hope that's not the case because you're in church, okay? But if you are here and you're like, you know what? I don't even know that Jesus loves me. We got to take care of that before we can send you on a mission field, all right? If you're here today and you don't know the love of Jesus Christ, if you're here today and you're like, man, I've seen these kids worship. Hmm. I know we got to go, but I, I I had a dad tell me this. Jake, you'll be fine. I had a dad tell me this this past week, and this gets serious as we end. A dad looked at me and said, I wish I could get back to being as excited to worship Jesus as my children are this week at VBS. He said, I'm watching my kids worship, and I'm desperate to get back to that point. Guys, if nothing else, these kids ministered to their own father. That's being a missionary. Maybe you're here and you're like, you know what? I've seen these kids excited about Jesus. I've seen Reed be excited about Jesus. I see Pastor Matt excited about Jesus, and I don't have that excitement. If that's you, stick around after service, and I'd love, love to share the joy of Jesus Christ with you. All right? One last plug. Two different places. If you'd like to see ministry opportunities at Anthony Drive, these papers will be laid out across this front pew. Just walk by, give them a look. Don't sign on them. If you need to talk about a relationship with Jesus, I'll be back in the back. You can grab me, and we can pray. All right? Guys, we love you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Reed, for coming and sharing your testimony. Thank you so much to the White family for allowing him to be here. Let's pray. Father God, we just love you. Lord Jesus, we love you and we thank you and we praise you, God. And I am so encouraged by these kids that have come and have just shared their excitement. Father, I thank you for hours upon hours that you have just poured into them in order that they might serve you. Father, I thank you for a church that is encouraging to its young people. God, that we don't look at them and stick them off to the side and say this isn't for you. Father, they are not the church of tomorrow. They are the church of right now. Father, they are just as much a member here as I am. And, Father, they can serve you just as well as I can. And so, Father, I just pray that you would lead them, that you would guide them, that you would train them up. Father, that you would sanctify them, make them into world changers. And, Father, I pray, God, that we, as the older generation, would encourage them every step of the way. And, Father, I pray that if there's somebody here today that needs to know you as their Savior, 
Father, that before they leave this building, before they get out these doors, God, I pray that you would give them the courage. I pray, God, that you would give them the desire to come and just say, I need to hear more about Jesus who can save my life. Father, we thank you that you're faithful. We thank you that you love us. Lord, I praise you for everything that you have done in this church today and the things that you will continue to do. And it is in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen, church. We love you. We'll see you next. Well, I won't see you next week. Two weeks.